Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good afternoon. Good morning. My name is Cheryl Davis, and I'm the executive director of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. I'm pleased to be back at the Commonwealth Club for today's program. The very roots of my organization go back to 1964, when the modern day civil rights movement manifested in San Francisco through demonstrations against hotels, supermarkets, drive-in restaurants, and automobile showrooms that discriminated against African-Americans. For over 50 years, the Human Rights Commission has grown in response to San Francisco's mandate to address, its, to address the causes and problems of resulting from prejudice, intolerance, bigotry, and discrimination. Thus, I can think of no more important issues today than addressing racism and delivering on the promise of America here in San Francisco and across the United States. I can think of no one more prepared to discuss these issues than the feature guest today's program, Theodore R. Johnson. His new book, When the Stars Begin to Fall, Overcoming Racism and Renewing the Promise of America is out this week. Dr. Ted is a senior fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. He is joining us from Washington, DC. Ted, welcome to the Commonwealth Club. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. Okay, with those introductions out of the way, one quick important housekeeping tip before we get started with today's discussion. If you have a question for either Dr. Ted or me, please use the YouTube chat feature. Questions asked there will be submitted to me throughout the program and I will try to ask as many of them as I can during the program. All right, well, let's uh, jump in. Again, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, I'm super excited to meet you and, and more excited to, to talk with you. This is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So I have I shared with you already, but <laughs> I have uh, written in and blue done my posted notes throughout the book. And um, I, I want to say my first kind of question that I wanted to start with is um, I think I should probably start with, like, why did you write the book? But beyond that, I am um, a lover of poetry, all things Langston Hughes. Mm. And, and I'm really there's so much of this book that seems to to me, it speaks to me through this poetry and prose. And, and you talk about song and um, just the, the basis of the connectivity of faith and spirituality and and the ability to really build the solidarity movement that you talk about. And um, I immediately am drawn to the book and think about what happens to a dream deferred or mm. even some of the other pieces. And so I, I want to start with the personal like poetry seems to really be important to you, too. Is it you've kind of weaved it throughout this book? Can you tell us more about your connection to poetry and, and the work that you do? Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Um, and you're, you're right. And I actually hadn't thought of it in, in that way until you just asked the question. But it is both in the prose, especially in some of the parts of the book where I'm talking about family and family history. I think there's a poetic quality to the rhetoric there uh, on purpose to the literary voice. Um, I think one of the um, parts of the book opens up with the Langston Hughes poem, uh, Let America Be America. Again, it was, it was one of the, the ringing um, stanzas out of that. And, um, and, and there is even the book title comes from a, a verse from an old spiritual that, that enslaved black people used to sing, um, you know, ostensibly about a, a Christian song about the rapture and sort of ascending to heaven, but actually a song about emancipation and wanting their own freedom and liberty, things they couldn't sing about 
explicitly. Uh, and so they cloaked their desire for personal freedom, individual liberties in Christian themes, because that was more acceptable to, to those that, uh, that ran the institution of slavery. So it does interact with poetry quite a bit, both in its truth telling, um, in its lyrical voice, little lyrical quality, but also in its ultimately aspirational um, and emotional appeals for us to be better than we are, better than we have been, and hopefully take a step closer to being all that we can be if we live up to the American creed. Right. Thank you so much. And so much of what you just defined really speaks to what you talk about um, and really the theme of the book in terms of solidarity and um, and moving forward. I, I'm immediately drawn to when you were talking a Harriet Tubman of sorts, right, using song and faith um, to kind of move her people. And so with that, I, my next question is really around the overall theme, this idea of solidarity and and using the, the strategies of a, a group of people to be able to move that forward. Can you say more just about the theme and, and how you even come up with some of the, the ideas that you put forward? Yeah, it's um, and so this is. Uh, a book that is a bunch of puzzle pieces that I've tried to put together to show a new picture or a refreshed picture that others have explained in the past. And so um, in, in its own right, each one of these things could be its own book. It's I, I describe the book as a three legged stool of three legged stools. So the bir- the, the, the first big stool um, is the backbone of the book. And, and it is it's three claims. The, the first one is that structural racism is an existential threat to America. And I say that plainly, explicitly, right from the outset. But the the distinction is that I'm not talking about the United States. I'm talking about uh, structural racism being an existential threat to America. And so whereas the United States is a geopolitical entity, it's a nation state that's governed by its interests. A, um, America is a set of ideals, so the belief that we're all created equal, that we have these unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that it's the government's job, the government's responsibility to ensure the deliverance of these unalienable rights and this broader um, principle of equality. And so structural racism, while the United States has proven that it can live quite comfortably with it, um, the uh, idea of America cannot. It cannot live alongside racism and both of them uh, exist. One has to give way to the other. The second part of this claim is that national solidarity gives us our best shot at mitigating the threats of the effects of racism on our society. And so national solidarity is, um, it's a combination of different kinds of solidarities, political, civic, a little bit social. But um, I define it as when a group of dissimilar people come together, unite together over a just or moral cause in order to hold the state accountable for being in breach of the social contract. So typically, uh, when people come together in solidarity, it might be like a union demanding higher pay, better benefits, but it's a material interest is the thing that's brought them together. In national solidarity, it is a moral interest. It is a a cause of justice that that people unite over, and then they hold the state accountable to address this. The last leg of this stool, uh, of the argument of this stool, is that Black America holds lessons for national solidarity. Black Americans are the descendants of a several groups of African peoples who were smashed together under the lash of slavery. And they didn't speak the same languages. They didn't have the same religions, customs, cultures, different dialects, but they became one people when oppression arrived or when, when they arrived to the oppression that awaited them. And so the solidarity that black Americans have discovered over the course of the nation's history contains attributes that the nation would be wise to adapt. If it also wants to exhibit a solidarity that compels the United States to be behave more like the America that we, that we have, the America of our ideals. So there's so much, like you said, to unpack in that. And, um, you know, when you talk about the national solidarity or the movement, there are a couple of things that really stuck out to me and um, would love, I think, to go through the book and get more of that. But the idea of personal action and group action. Right. This idea of like, what's that responsibility for us to uh, within our personal space, within our um, larger context of the Mm. group space. And and I think about the 
the story you tell of your family and um, the impact of potentially Booker T. Washington being invited to the White House, right? Like that personal action had this larger kind of ripple effect. Right. And, um, you know, say more about even your your development individually and impacting being impacted by your family, just this work. And I see, I see the flag behind you and it makes me think about the the image of your grandfather with the flag and like, how do these things contribute to even the story that you're telling? Yeah. And so, and so some of this I think is inevitable. Um, You know, I'm a retired military officer. So that, you know, I've got my, the flag here of that was flown over the Pentagon on the day of my retirement. Um, I'm named Theodore Roosevelt Johnson, the third. So I'm a, a, a black kid from North Carolina named after a rich white New Yorker who was a Republican from over a century ago. Um, And this is because uh, I I was named, I'm the third, so I was named after my father and my grandfather. And my grandfather was given that name because of the dinner you cited when President Teddy Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington to the White House for dinner, which is the first time ever that a black man dined at the White House uh, because dining together symbolizes equality. And the nation in 1901, when this dinner happened, was not ready to accept racial equality. So Roosevelt's action was actually a bold one. For him, it was very pragmatic. He wanted to talk politics in the South, but for a number of people, and especially black sharecroppers in the South, this was a really meaningful gesture. Uh, So much so that my great grandparents, Will and Annie Johnson, named their third son after after the white president instead of the black Booker T. Washington respected educator, um, because almost as a political strategy, a, a way of claiming America for their family by seeing no contradiction that the black child of South Carolina sharecroppers could be named after a president, uh, a respected president of the United States. And perhaps one day, you know, um, sojourn to the White House uh, just as Booker T. had. And that's my father's side. On my mother's side, you you mentioned this picture of my great grandfather, um, who we affectionately called Daddy Joe. He, too, was a sharecropper in southwest Georgia. And and with all of the things sharecropping entails, including exploitative um, exploitative uh, economic arrangements, um, segregation, not being able to vote, uh, the threat of violence at his doorstep. And yet um, he went to, I guess it was like a county fair and took a picture with two American flags angled over his shoulder and this uh, pride beaming through a smirk on his face and, and a pipe hanging out his mouth, as if to say, you may think these flags represent you and only you and belong to you and only you, but I'm here staking my claim with comfort and confidence that these are just as much my stars and stripes as they are yours. And so in, in that regard, the respect for the country uh, and claiming the country despite the experience of Black Americans um, is, is sort of in my DNA. Yeah, and it seems you've you've continued that through your work. You've you've covered um, this idea of racism and the the work of racism across um, publications and across you know really different spectrums and viewpoints. And um, why is that important to you to not keep it within you know to as they say only preach to the choir, but really right. <laughs> share it broadly. Right. So the the thing about solidarity is it, the only way it works is if the people actually are standing together in such a way um, that is uh, re- that requires sacrifice and forbearance among all those who are involved. And that gets its power from bringing dissimilar people together under a moral cause, under a, a just reason, not bringing people who already agree with one another to, um, to stand together. While the latter is important, uh, the, when it comes to a project like America, a nation of 330 million people from different regions, dialects, religions, customs, cultures, races, ethnicities, etc. You have to create connection across difference if you believe democracy is the proper way to move forward. If you believe that an egalitarian society where our unalienable rights are respected, you have to form bonds of connection with those who are different from you. 
And so the the goal in all of these writings, I've written for very conservative magazines after George Floyd was murdered. I've written for very uh, progressive newspapers about reparations. Uh, and you, there are times where people who call me names when I write about reparations, six months later, find themselves agreeing with me when I write about race and abuses of state power or the, the need for, um, uh, you know, for, for more competition in or, or, or like school choice or something like that. You know, they, they see their arguments in my experience. And some of that is, I think it's two. One is my life experience as a military veteran and as a black man. Uh, sometimes those two identities get me into different rooms or, and people are willing to um, embrace my point of view because of that. Um, but otherwise, I intentionally engage audience where they are and try to make compelling arguments for solidarity in the language language in which they often use to talk about the country and their experience in the country. So for conservative audiences, I talk a lot about the promise of America. And for progressive audiences, I talk a lot about the shortfalls of America. But I tell both I tell both of those stories to both sides. But I lead differently and I frame the issues differently so that you don't alienate potential um, people you can stand in solidarity with before you've had the opportunity to make the case. Yeah, I mean, you make a really good point there just about like not alienating and, and being able to connect on those fronts. And I wonder for you navigating those three kind of people that you talk about, right? Like the, for me, one is the researcher and kind of the academic. Mm -hmm. One is the military person. And then the other is this rich cultural experience of uh, being black in America. Right. And like, how do you how do you kind of walk in that space. It's a yeah, it's tough sometimes. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've, in fact, I've written for a very conservative magazine about, um, talking about Ka Colin Kaepernick kneeling during the national anthem while in uniform in the Pentagon days before retirement and saying to my friend, I understand what Kaepernick is doing because I've been the black guy pulled over by police and then taken to jail over uh, that's something that turned out to be nothing um, simply because they suspected I was doing something wrong. So I, I you know, this is the, the uh, concept that Du Bois talked about, W.B. Du Bois talked about a century ago um, in The Soul of Black Folks, where he calls it double consciousness or this two-ness, where, you know, in black people, you've got the Negro and the American, these two in irreconcilable souls struggling to stay together in one body and only the strength the strength of the, the the black experience is able to hold them together and I think what's what I'm trying to do in this book is show that there's actually nothing incompatible with being black and being American I can be a black man who's pulled over by police and a black man who pulls a uniform over his shoulders and love America just as much as I critique her for falling short of all the promises that the nation and, and its leaders have made over the years but but the problem is that society causes the nation to see me differently because of my skin. And sometimes society causes the nation to see me differently because of my service. So um, I can if I am a, a black man in a restaurant, um, that experience is different when I'm a black man in a mess in a restaurant with a retired Navy shirt on or with one of my alma mater's shirts on. And so it's the, it's the different ways that society imposes identities and um, experience upon us. And there's nothing within our identities that are naturally intention. So the, the beauty of the American project, and if it's going to work, if it's truly going to be a multiracial democracy, inclusive democracy, is not forcing people to choose between their identities. You can be a person of color and have, you know, be man, woman, whatever your gender expression and be a, a patriot. And none of these things knocks the other out of the park. They, they, they all get to coexist together. Um, but it, it is a proactive and very difficult endeavor um, because uh, many political and economic leaders are looking at ways to turn our identities against one another as a way of preventing solidarity from taking shape and, uh, and thereby preventing the people from holding the government accountable. Yeah. And I think that there's something to that in terms of like what what you're saying in terms of dual identities and being able to move in space. And, and what you share in the book is to highlight some of these. But I, I, I preface all of this to introduce this first question around. I do think that there's a sense that um, with the book, you're offering hope, right? Mm -hmm. Hope for solidarity, but also the the hope for solidarity that's come from the Black experience, right? And right. And, and I think about, um, there's a line from 
uh, that Dr. King says that we must um, accept uh, uh, finite disappointment and meet it with infinite hope, right? That mm. even though we have these things happening. And so this first question is, do you feel you're promulgating fear into the African-American community, which makes people believe the odds are stacked against them? And I think, you know, part of this is pointing out the, the challenges, but um, I think you offer hope, but I, you know, what would be your answer to that? Seth? Yeah, so this is not a book of fear at all. Uh, in fact, even in the face of the worst set of circumstances, like my enslaved three times great grandfather or my sharecropping great grandparents on both of my uh, pater paternal and maternal side, fear is never in their experience. Fear is never in how I write about them and doesn't care characterize their approach to the world world or how they um, live their lives. Um, in fact, courage and strength um, and um, love of country and, uh, and, and optimism are sort of the expressions or, or the emotions most intimately associated with all of the ways I talk about my family experience and my own. This is an aspirational book. It is optimistic about the project of America, but it is realistic about the challenges that racism is, is uh, confronting or is presenting our country today and has its, its inception. So this is a book that white readers will read and see some of their American story in mind. They will see um, the appreciation for the progress of the country in this book, and they will see how structural racism harms them and their families. And black readers will come to this and see the exact same thing. Their stories and my family story, their hope uh, in, in America and the progress that's come and their um, all of the ways that structural racism harms them. So this is uh, not a book meant to instill fear and not even a book meant to make people angry or vengeful about our history, but to make people appreciate the appreciate our history, the progress since then, but not lose the lessons that um, have uh, unalterably changed the lives of those who've come before us. And, uh, and now we are presented with an opportunity to change the nation for the better for those who come after us. Thanks. And I think, what do you think about the timing of your book and what's going on um, nationally? Don't, you know, did you realize that it would be so timely when you were working on it? You know, I didn't. Uh, and that's probably naive of me because this is an issue that is always timely in, in our country. It seems like there's not a five block period in our nation's history where a book that talks about the challenge of racism isn't isn't timely. But I'll be honest with you. I thought the best time for this book to come out would have been in the summer of last year. And I finished writing the manuscript in August of 2019. So the book has been pretty much completed for nearly two years. And my hope was that it would come out in the summer of 2020, just before the presidential election, as a way of reframing the conversation around race, just as Americans were going to the polls where race was easily going to be central to, to the, the, the election. And what I didn't know at the time was that the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery would refocus the nation on the challenge race presents. And the summer of racial justice protests, I think it would have been um, a, a good moment to drop that there. But now looking back, um, I think this is the better moment. One, and as my publisher argued at the time, during a presidential election, it's really hard to break through the politics of the moment and the divisiveness and people are sort of playing teams um, at the time. So not really in the mood for solidarity before an election. But January 6th, um, in the Capitol insurrection suggests that for all the solidarity we saw in the summer of 2020 and those protests and people coming together and declaring the state had overstepped its power, um, January 6th showed us that the backlash to that was also inevitable. And so I'm kind of pleased that the book comes after a glimpse of national solidarity and then it falling through our fingertips, uh, falling out of our grasp, um, just to show how difficult it is to realize and maintain solidarity and just how important it is for us to do so unless, uh, unless the nation succumb to anti-democratic and illiberal impulses that move us further away from the nation we say we want to be. Yeah, I, I, um, 
just in thinking about all of that and seeing uh, the idea and notion of solidarity with everything that's going on with regards to the increase in hate crimes and mm -hmm. specifically focused on the Asian API community, as well as um, what we're seeing um, with the impact of COVID on mm -hmm. um, people of color. There are all these questions about how do we not get into the oppression Olympics? How do we actually build this national kind of solidarity, even just local solidarity? And I feel right. like this, this book is a tool for that, right? Like it really is a strategy to help people have those deeper conversations and engagements. How do you hope that the, the book will be used? What do you, what do you envision it um, moving forward? Not just being a tool where somebody just reads it independently, but do you have other ideas? of how this can be interesting. Yeah, I, I, I do hope the book helps us think differently about how to confront the challenge of racism and frankly helps us think differently about the challenge racism presents. I, I, so to that latter point, uh, too many folks think that when we say the word racism, we mean white people not liking people of color or treating them differently. And what I say in this book is actually racism is a crime of the state. We all suffer when racism is allowed to persist. And so all people across race and ethnicity uh, must come together in order to hold the state accountable for allowing the structural racism, the, the racism that reshapes our society in a way that advantages some groups over others for no other reason than race. Um, we have to all come together in order to uh, prevent that kind of racism from preventing, from stopping the nation from living up to its principles. So I hope that reframing of the, the challenge racism presents will be helpful. The second part is, um, I like every time we talk about the biggest moments of national unity in our country, it's always after we've been attacked by a foreign nation or adversary. So 9-11, oh, look at the unity then. And after Pearl Harbor, look at how much unity there was around World War II. But if you were a Japanese American after Pearl Harbor, your chances of being interned by the government in, in, in an act that the Constitution or that the Supreme Court said was constitutional was high. And so we incarcerated, we interned Japanese Americans after Pearl Harbor. And even though we were also at war with Germany and Italy, we didn't uh, intern German Americans and Italian Americans. So that moment of national unity still was racist uh, or had a, a racist outcome in, in, a, in a one respect. Uh, another and another respect in denying black veterans access to the GI Bill, for example, after 9-11, if you were a Muslim in America, if you were Arabic, if you worshipped at a mosque or if you were a Sikh, which people mis mistook for, for being Arabic, then the chances of you experience a hate crime have, have risen. Similarly, with coronavirus, not only has it disproportionately affected people of color in terms of, of sickness and death, but if you are Asian American, a lot of that, uh, a lot of the hate crime we're seeing now, as you mentioned, is are people attacking Asian Americans because of, of how the coronavirus has been framed by national leaders. Uh, and so racism isn't this unfortunate thing that just so happens to live alongside the, the nation. It is central to the challenges that have stopped us from becoming the more perfect union that Lincoln talked about. And so in, in these ways, I hope it helps people understand that the problem is bigger than us and our individual behaviors. And it is structural, which is going to require a combined response to hold the state accountable. When you talk about structural and I think about you just made mention of, um, you know, times when people have come together, whether it's, um, you know, in, in with regards to the Civil War, or other folks, uh, other times. And um, I, I want to ask you, because you, you made uh, talked about something you've written around reparations in the past. And mm -hmm. there were so many pieces in the book where I kind of were like, oh, my gosh, that's that's something else to think about when you think about rep reparations. When you think about folks who served in the Civil War, um, black people, and they weren't able to draw down pensions, or even as we continue to move forward, you think about GI bills and, and some of the wealth that's maybe been lost to communities right. of color because they weren't able to draw down on that. Would love to know more about your ideas around reparations or even um, just th these little bits and pieces that I was gleaming from the book that kind of allude to that. 
Yeah. So the I, I do talk a little bit about policy solutions in the back end, but they're broader than like specific things like reparations. They're uh, broader things about like reforming our democratic institutions to be more fair, uh, things like civic education or national service. But but here's what I'll say about like specific policy questions. The, the first thing is one of the uh, chapters in the book argues that in the, the idealistic American society is not a colorblind one. It is actually color conscious. And, and this, this rubs some folks the wrong way because they, so, you know, Martin Luther King said not to be judged by the, con- by the color of our skin, content of our character. That's fine. Yeah. I don't want to be judged by the color of my skin, but I don't want the color of my skin to not matter. I, I actually like being black. And I think it adds something to the American experience when we bring the diversity of experiences and customs and cultures to this collective uh, nation. Um, so, uh, it ha- color conscious just means that the path that black people have had in America is different from the path of Native Americans. It's different from the path of, of you know, second generation white immigrants or fifth generation white immigrants even. And, and so if we don't have the same paths and experiences in America and our outcomes are different in America, the public policy that needs to be, be put forward to make the promise uh, or the uh, yeah, the, the promise of our unalienable rights um, realizable and the American dream more achievable for all of us needs to take into account our specific historical experiences in the country. And so the only way to do that is to look at the experiences of particular groups and say, this is the policy that will help them become more integrated and more um, equal in our society. So you don't want to give the same set of policies to rural Appalachia, you know, five-year-olds there as you would to, you know, kids in South central Los Angeles, who are who are five years old. Yes, the education system in both places may not be optimal, but the solutions aren't necessarily uh, uniform or the same because the experiences and the histories are different. There's that piece. The other piece is, um, is something that Eddie Gloud, uh, the Princeton professor, calls the value gap. And what he says there is as long as one group in, in or groups in a democracy are valued less than another group, then whatever policy you put in place is going to be implemented with inequality as the outcome. Because even if the policy is colorblind and uniform, the way people behave within society is going to create inequality because some people are valued less. And so my thinking, if we did reparations right this minute, we may close the wealth gap. But what would happen the following day if black people aren't seen as valuable, if they're not seen as as a as a asset, an asset to the nation is that the most exploitive financial vehicles the world has ever seen will emanate the, the day after reparation checks go out because banks and car loan places and all these, these folks will be looking for ways to reappropriate the money that was redistributed to black Americans because they don't think those folks are valuable, that their interests shouldn't be protected. So the phrase Black Lives Matter isn't just about criminal justice. It's actually a declaration that we need to be valued in this society if this society is ever going to be an egalitarian one. And barring that valuation, barring that seeing us as equals, um, then whatever policy implementation or policy proposals you put forward, uh, the, the outcomes are going to produce or reproduce inequality because some people are seen as less uh, less important or less valuable to the society. And, and that's one of the, I, I feel like the themes too, through the book, right? This idea of how are we understanding how folks are viewed and how mm-hmm. that viewpoint impacts, right? The, the ability to actually um, push the objective, right? So the, what you talk about, the perceived objective of, America versus the the actualized mm. or what they actually do, right? So to that degree, like how do we, um, you know, I think that that's the optimism that you offer is this, how are we um, coming together with folks when we know that they're not really doing it for the right reason, right? right. Like that, that challenge of, you know, how do you, and that's something that you, I think, express comes from your family, right? This idea yeah. of moving forward. Do you want to say more about that ability to, do the work, even though you know people aren't that interested in you individually. Right. Yeah. So the the optimism absolutely comes from from the family, and some of that is just from the black church. Um, if you can imagine people 
who were enslaved from, I mean, never mind since before the country was founded, but once America declared itself to be, once the United States said we exist and we believe all people are created equal, and they enslaved them, <laughs> enslaved uh, their fellow citizens or their, their fellow denizens, if they didn't consider them citizens, um, for the next 90 years, you had a people who operated in faith um, because that sometimes was the only thing that allowed them to make it through the day that awaited them. And then um, the civil wars fought, some constitutional amendments are passed, but very quickly after that, Jim Crow comes up and begins denying people constitutional rights and their very physical safety. And you have to have optimism and hope and faith that things will get better, not just to survive, but to raise families and, and live in communities full of people like you who are experiencing the same kinds of, of violence and deprivation of rights. So there's something inherently optimistic and, and, um, um, you know, that, that operates in faith from within the black church. And I think me growing up in the church was, was, was part of that. And I think that's a lot of where my family got its optimism uh, from too. But th another part of this is that, uh, it, you know, all of the sociology shows that we Americans are still segregated. Our housing neighborhoods, you know, that are segregated. Our schools are segregated. Um, many of our educational uh, institutions are segregated. And so in higher learning in, in, in that way. Uh, so um, and what we're seeing now is that instead of social media allowing us to get outside of our bubbles and meet new people, they're just expanding the bubbles we already live in. And so when you look at people's Facebook friends, for example, they tend to be of the same class, race, uh, as as the as the the Facebook account owner is, and so I think some something like um, eighty plus percent of Black people and ninety plus percent of white people only have one person of another race in their immediate social circle, um, and that is not enough if in a nation as large as ours, as diverse as ours. And so when you don't know people. And then you are fed lies about that group, like they're rapists or that they're lazy and just live off the state or that there's they're cutting in line for immigration or whatever the lie may be. Then uh, it's easier to believe the lie because you have no personal experience to disprove the thing that you're being told. And then if you do happen to have one friend of another race, that friend becomes the exception and not the, the, um, the exception to the rule and not, you know, uh, symbolic of the broader group itself or representative of the broader group. And so some of my solutions here are about, are about incentivizing Americans and maybe in, in some instances compelling Americans to get out of their bubbles and force, and force them to talk to their fellow citizens and, and because that's the only way this country will work. So this is, I think, like an incentivized national service program. Um, you know, my service in the military taught me that uh, it, when you get to know people, it's much harder to believe the stereotypes about, you know, people from certain parts of the country or whatever, because you've worked alongside them. You know them, you know their intelligence, how much they care, um, that sort of thing. And so a national service program that takes Americans from across the country and puts them together would introduce them to people they would never meet otherwise and put them, give them sort of like a superordinate project to pursue. But also um, civic education and like this concept of deliberative democracy, which um, means that people are not only coming together, but they're coming together to make choices about their community, like school budgets, like hiring of police chiefs, uh, and, and, and then have these decisions be deliberated on in town halls and then decisions be binding. And so in this way, people have to re learn how to compromise, have to learn uh, about the um, imp importance in some ways of incrementalism so that they can make some progress uh, in, in hopes of building a stronger, more connected society. Yeah, no, the, um, I'm just writing notes because there's just <laughs> a wealth of information, like the uh, ability to learn to compromise or the incrementalization, like that piece is really uh, huge, right? Because we want, like, even, you know, there's research that says small, short-term wins keep people going and keep them in the in the race. Right. And that as a part of this, like you mentioned, um, you know, we're still so very segregated, right? And this idea that even even our churches are still very segregated. That absolutely. Right. Um, and, and that learning and that optimism that we get, but even in our moments of optimism, we're still not surrounded by um, diversity. And, you know, when you mentioned uh, 
the black church. It just made me think there were pieces in the book where I was like, made me think about, and I don't know if you're familiar with it. There's a song by Chance the Rapper called Sunday Candy. And he, <laughs> and he goes through and he talks about his grandmother and peppermint candy. And I right. just, and it's like that piece of um, being prepared and being ready and grandparents and church and that whole experience. And, and um, I just get the sense you've said it already, but that family and your grandmother and other folks were really instrumental in instilling this idea of hope and optimism, much like the church. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, sort of faith, um, despite all evidence to the contrary, that, that the right thing will eventually happen and using it as personal fuel to keep going, not in the um, belief solely that having faith is going to change the country, but that having faith will allow me to make it through my experience in this country another day until hopefully, maybe one day change arrives. But the other thing is that the black church is also a very political instrument. I mean, we know politicians show up at black churches every time there's an election and that's not new. That's been happening for more than a century. And frankly, in terms of uh, getting insight into black communities through the church, that's as old as black people in America uh, is. So um, a couple of ideas that I pull out in the book, one is this idea of a of respectability politics. And I talk about this, it's sort of the, the tactic, the political strategy has fallen out of favor in recent years because the, the sense is you can't behave your way into equality. Like I, there's no, there no amount of education, no amount of dressing properly and having the proper etiquette is going to make people treat me like I'm their equal um, when I go out uh, if I'm in a society that, that doesn't, that still has a racial hierarchy. But um, what the politics of respectability was in its time in the early 19th, 20th century, was black church going women knowing the dangers that awaited in society for folks who dehumanized them. Black women were exposed to violence all the time because most of them could, especially in the North, could only get job, jobs as domestics. And in the South, even with those who were in the fields, still a disproportionate number of women um, were in um, in domestic roles, uh, either nursing babies or making dinner or cleaning or whatever. And when you're in domestic situations in a society that doesn't see you as fully human, you're exposed to physical violence, sexual violence, and all sorts of um, dehumanizing behaviors. And so black women's defense against this was if I'm dressed just as well, or just as, as, as nicely as I can be, if I speak the same way that they speak, if I exhibit all the things they consider high society or culture, it's harder for them to justify treating me like an animal. And to some extent, I mean, it was this tactic was adopted by the civil rights movement. And so when we see policemen with German shepherds and fire hoses beating black people in church clothes, behaving civilly and not being violent, it's very clear in that picture who the barbarian is and who isn't. And it's not the black person in their Sunday, their Sunday best. So it's a it's a the, the church provides a strategy. Um, through through uh, things like this to help folks uh, endure and to push the nation to be closer than who it professes uh, to be. Yeah, I, I just I, as you were talking, it just made me think about the you know growing up being told you had to work twice as hard to get right. half as much, the showing up in that regard, um, and then the the line where Chance says um, her peppermint is the truth, and when you said fuel to keep you going. I was like, they brought those little candies because you had, you were going to be in church for 20 hours yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> to get you through it. Um, but, but Benjamin Mays talks about church having been the place where black people could actually have some autonomy and some authority mm -hmm. and really develop the skills that they couldn't in uh, mainstream. So there's so much to that. Um, so I appreciate that. The, the next audience question that we have is um, our current debate on race is polarized by discussions around the 1619 project mm. and critical race theory. How can we get beyond these political debates and have the deeper discussions that you talk about? Yeah, it's, this is, I think a, a great uh, encapsulation of our problem with race, what's happening right now. Most people talking about critical race theory don't actually know what the theory says or its founding or what it does or anything. It's just a totem to divide us, uh, a, a way of distinguishing who us and our people are from them and those people. And right now it's happening along political lines. So the rejection of the 1619 project from those on the right um, is not really about the arguments in the actual 
actual work because uh, many of them have shown in their comments they've not actually read the work. The thing they take issue with is that someone has pointed to a problem the nation has not solved and says that this problem is central to our history and central to our, it needs to be central to our understanding if we want to move forward. And they would rather only point to our successes and our goodness and, um, and ignore the hardships or sort of hand wave that, yeah, that was bad, but we fixed it and only focus on the good of America as a way of bringing folks together. And what my book argue is, argues is you have to do both. You have to focus on our actual history, what, what really happened and the horrors that, were, uh, that happened alongside all the things the nation is proud of, like the Declaration and the Constitution. And you have to focus on the successes. I mean, I'm much happier being a black man in 2021 than in 1921 or 1821. So there is progress that we should um, be proud of and, and pay attention to, but also recognize that that progress didn't just happen. It wasn't inevitable. It wasn't, um, you know, and the American spirit washing over people and giving us epiphanies. This was the product of a lot of death, sweat, and blood. It was the product of work against a system and a society that did not want to move in the direction that it ultimately did because of, of people's uh, work. So uh, my, my thing is, look, you in rose bushes, you get the thorns and you get the roses and you take both together in order to fully understand the beauty of, of the bush. And the same thing is here. Um, we shouldn't just focus on the horrors of slavery and we shouldn't just focus on all the goodness and the ideals of America. We actually have to focus on how one points to our our shortcomings from reaching the other. And let's talk about the distance between these dots, both the distance we've traveled and the distance yet to go in order to, uh, to bring the nation together. The problem with the conversation now is instead of uh, focusing on the distance we've come and the distance to go, one side is pointing at the other saying, all they want to do is talk about the starting point. And the other side is saying, these people, uh, all they want to do is talk about the end point, like we've arrived. And they immediately start pointing at the other as not loving the country enough, not being honest and trying to undermine the nation um, instead of bring it together. The, the last point I want to make about this is this is the tactic that political and economic leaders have used since our inception. Every time racism comes up, the first tactic is tell me who was harmed and who's to blame. And in doing that, you now pit people against people. When you say white people are responsible for slavery, that means black people have been victimized and thereby um, it's up to white people to make it better. And the problem is Actually, slavery was a product of the state. The state allowed, the United States allowed slavery to exist and endure. And white people benefited in that system and black people were harmed in that system, but the state allowed it. And the effects of that state decision, the founders talk plainly about their decision to leave it alone. Um, Lincoln talks plainly about his decision to wage the Civil War for the Union and not because of slavery. That was just the byproduct of this other goal. The fact that we've not confronted this head on means that the, the wound is still open and leaders today are poking at the wound in order to divide us instead of trying to uh, to address the wound and, and bring us together because it's politically expedient and it's economically advantageous to keep the people divided instead of uh, united and in solidarity to demand, uh, make greater demands of the state and demand that it be responsive. And so for those folks who are kind of, um, you know, in this, this space of, um, well, it's the, the blaming and whose fault it is. And you should want it more. If you wanted it bad enough, you would you would mm -hmm. get it or it's not racism. It's just, you know, you don't want it bad enough. Like what's the, the response or the message? You know, and I know that there, you, you talk about some of that, but like what's this general like when we go places and they're like, pull yourself up by your your bootstraps. <laughs> Yeah, it's, this is another trick. I mean, I, I think the the idea that everything wrong in our society can be fixed either by you working harder or by that group over there doing better is a narrative we've been fed to suggest that the government has the government has no place in fixing the problem. And so poverty. It's not the government's fault that society is structured in a way that some people are, are destined to end up in poverty and other folks have the, the path to the middle class paved for them. It's not the government's fault. It's the, the, the problem is that those poor people don't know how to work hard and those poor people don't take care of their neighborhoods and don't send their kids to school and don't manage their money well. And if they just did that, 
then all everything they have to succeed, they need to succeed in America is just there waiting for them that only they would work hard. And that's just not true. It, it, it's, it's not true. And by pointing to, well, look at uh, Oprah or look at this basketball player as an example of people, the fact that you can only point to these national figures is the exception that proves the rule that our society is structured in a way that advantages some groups over over others. And this is not just along racial lines. If you are a white person living in the mountains of North Carolina and you are looking at the white person um, who is the son of or the, the daughter of college graduates in Charlotte and, and live in an upper middle class home, that white child in Appalachia does not have the same chance at success as the white child um, with good parents and a good household income in Charlotte does. And it, it, but the point is, when you layer race on top of that poverty plus being of color um, compared to uh, a middle class and being white, the disparity increases. So we not only have a class issue in America, but racism exacerbates every issue. If you look at health disparities, educational disparities, income, wealth, whatever your socioeconomic factor, you can point to um, two sets of white people and show disparities. But as soon as you add color to that disparity, it increases exponentially. That is the sign of a society that is struggling with race. And because uh, racism is so corrosive and destructive, even the uh, the white Americans who are not getting from this country what they should uh, can't find allegiance with black Americans who are not getting from the country what they should, because racism is the thing. It, it's it's the divide. It's the moat that keeps uh, folks away from one another. So um, it, this is that reframing is um uh, has proven over our history to be very effective for those who hold power. And the only way to uh, to counter it is by finding connection, finding solidarity across difference and holding the state accountable for not delivering on, on the promise. That's not easy work and it's not easily done. It requires each of us to get out of our bubbles, to proactively go meet people who are not like us, put ourselves in situations where it's just us in a, in a room full of other folks and, and in finding a way to make connections there. Uh, and it's a long-term en endeavor. But if we really believe in this country that we have, then there's no other option except to surrender it and allow it to fall to those who would prefer a society structured on racial hierarchy, on class hierarchy that leaves the majority behind to the benefit of a very few. And you have a um, unique viewpoint, right, in terms of um, military and being black, right? And that in a lot of ways in America, you, people will presume you have one viewpoint that um, mm -hmm. trumps the other one, right? That this idea of military and depending on how long someone is in military, that they're going to be more conservative in thought and less likely to believe or um, espouse racism as a, an issue that challenges. How have you navigated those spaces? Uh, you know, I, and, and I appreciated one of the the pieces in the book where you talk about like being in this military setting, but, you know, being fully your black self. And, and yeah. so how do you navigate that? Yeah, it, it, it was tough. Um, and sometimes easier than others. I mean, I've been overseas with, um, you know, uh, out with a group of other officers and I'm the only black one and have felt more connected to them as Americans than to the black people around me because of the cultural divide there. Um, but I've also been told by those same folks that my promotion was an affirmative action handout. You know, I've been told by those same folks, you know, jokes about, you know, ethnic jokes, you know, the size of the nose or the lips or, you know, like the, the very racist things that are not acceptable. Uh, and so the, the two don't come differently. Like they don't come separated, they come together. And so part of America is both accepting its ugliness and fighting to change it and accepting the beauty of it and, and fighting to, to make it uh, more aligned to that. Um, the, the, you know, I, the, the Kaepernick episode is, is one that I've, I've talked about a lot because um, I would never kneel for the national anthem because of my military background, but um, I absolutely understand why, why folks are kneeling because I've also been subjected to unfair treatment by police. Um, it, it, and I don't, I don't feel like I've had to choose there, but it, but it is difficult um, to navigate. 
the, the one thing I'll say, though, is, uh, you know, something like one in four black people identify as conservative in the United States. Um, about 30 percent identify as liberal or progressive. And then the remainder identify as moderate. And so finding a black conservative is pretty easy. If you've ever been in a barbershop or a church or a family reunion or a beauty salon, you've talked to people who have expressed values or ideas, ideologies um, that align with what conservatives say they want. The issue is that black folks tend to vote for Democrats in every congressional and presidential election because the question of civil rights dominates everything else. And so if one party is perceived to be progressive on things like voting rights protections and the other party is seen to be regressive in terms of making it difficult for certain groups to vote, especially those groups that don't vote for them, then the question of civil rights trumps everything else. And so, yeah, I have particular views on the economy or taxes or education or energy or defense policy or the environment. But all of that gets all of that gets muted by um, this election is about the party that's going to make it easier for me to participate in this democracy and the party that's going to make it more difficult. And in this way, the conservatism that would otherwise find voice in black America is muted because um, politicians find it more advantageous to exploit racial division and, and allow it to uh, perpetuate and fester than to bring people together over ideas. Look, we say we're a nation that was founded on an idea and we never, we don't appeal to people based on ideas. We appeal to people based on identities. And that is one of the prime reasons, primary reasons why we've not lived up to the promise because we've not yet um, behaved as, as if it's our guiding star. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I've often said to people when we get into these conversations around um, justice reform and police reform, um, that if you go knock on my grandmother's door or somebody else's, That's they're right. going to be like, what do you mean? Don't not to have police. Like we are, um, you know, by and large, the, especially our older generation within the black community is pretty conservative in how yeah. they think and how they operate. And, um, you know, I have to catch myself sometime with my son when he's listening to music or his clothes. And I realize that I'm also <laughs> my grandmother's <laughs> daughter, but that, right. uh, you know, like there are these pieces that are really embedded and that are cultural that I think go back to what you said before around how we have to present ourselves, this idea right. of um, how people perceive and, uh, you know, just all of these pieces to unpack in terms of the defining of who people are and this superlative citizenship that has, mm. is almost genetic at this point, you know, that That's you right. about <laughs> in the book. That's right. Um, and I, I was wondering, you know, as we talk about, um, and your duality and, and military and all that. Uh, and you, you, you have the let America be America. And I think about, I too sing America. And I felt like some mm. of what you were talking about in the book is about this duality of, you know, am I military or am I, am I black? Do I get the same rights and privileges um, as everyone else or do, what do you see first when I walk in the room, which is right. That you said. Right. Yeah. And so one way I like to sort of bring this together is, um, we all recognize that the national anthem is, is one of those rituals that is uh, American, is supposed to bring people together across diversity and difference, et cetera. Um, it's been a tool of division recently um, because of how leaders have behaved, but ideally it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be 90 seconds of connection. Um, the most beautiful rendition of the national anthem, maybe that certainly that I've ever heard, but arguably that maybe 75, 80% of the country's ever heard was Whitney Houston's in 1991. Now, Whitney Houston is the granddaughter of sharecroppers from Southwest Georgia. She's the child of Newark, New Jersey. She grew up in the gospel in the black church singing gospel. Uh, and she dons a track suit with the American flag on it at the Super Bowl, you know, uh, arguably one of the most civilly religious events in the country, you know, where the nation sort of pauses and comes together and watches this football game while the nation is at war in Iraq and Kuwait with military jets flying over and sings the national anthem in a way that almost makes her seem like a Disney princess and its orchestration and her beautiful vocals. And that is for me, is 90 seconds of all that America has to offer, uh, all that the black experience in America has to teach us about who we can be if we would just stop fighting it, and, um, the, and how there is no uh, incompatibility. There's no tension between being black and American as long as we don't allow it, as long as we don't allow those external to it to uh, 
demand we decide on which identity takes precedence over the other. And I think if we can sort of capture that moment, bottle it and sort of um, uh, uh, distribute it around the country as the basis for this is what connection could look like if we were really willing to uh, surrender to it and live up to our ideals, then, um, you know, I think the the country will be to be a, a, a much better place and we would be one step closer to leaving a better nation to posterity. Awesome. I have one more question from the audience, but I, I'm not sure we'll have time for you to actually unpack it. And I wanted to drop this in. I don't I haven't had a chance to research this, but I've heard that Lift Every Voice and Sing was on the list to actually become the national anthem. So, um, you know, which is now the Negro national anthem. That's right. that, uh, um, and I know you mentioned that in the in the book. So this last question, interesting comment. The state is a reflection of who we are. I think there's a danger in your argument of displacing the problem of racism. Mm, uh, perhaps. And so some of it is if we don't, if we think about racism narrowly, as in interpersonal hatred, there is a danger in, in saying the state is responsible on both sides. There's a danger on the left when they say America hates black people, for example, that's dangerous because the only, if America hates black people, the solution is to get rid of America and start something new that doesn't hate black people. It's dangerous on the right because um, if, if you think if, if the accusation is that this place hates others, it sort of feeds a, a, a religious ethno nationalism, uh, which suggests that America is actually a place for white Christians and everyone else uh, doesn't really belong. And they're only here by our our good graces. Both of those are extremely dangerous. But the argument in the book is that one, think about racism differently. Think about it as the way our society is structured. That makes it more difficult for some groups to live than it does for other groups. And if that is the problem, if if we have a disparity emanating from our structures, public policy is the solution. And the state is the vehicle by which public policy um, is implemented. The last thing I'll say uh, on on this short, too short answer is that the state isn't motivated by our moral or principled arguments. States only have interests. And so states will do what is in their interest. When slavery and a free, cheap, cheap labor force was in the state's interest, it turned its eye, even as it said, all men are created equal. But when slavery became a problem of keeping the union and the state determined that being connected, being united was more important than being uh, divided, then it was in the state's interest to abolish slavery um, to keep the union Uh, and keeping the union being the interest, not ending slavery. So if we make racism, uh, ending racism, a moral cause and demand the state be responsive to that moral demand, we will fall short. So one of the ideas I talk about in the book is trickle down citizenship, which is when a people takes their moral demands of the state and marries it to the state's interest, like in the civil, like in the uh, civil rights movement, where much of our uh, success was because of the Cold War and the lies that the uh, the, the Soviet Union, well, uh, you know, we were telling the world that we are a place for democracy and freedom and the Soviet Union would say, but you lynch Negroes. And so that's a very effective way of like shutting down this whole democracy thing when you point out the hypocrisy. And so by marrying our moral claim to the nation's interest, which was winning the Cold War and beating the Soviets, uh, we had 20 years of racial progress that we'd not seen since the Civil War from 1948's desegregation of the military and the federal workforce to 1968's Fair, Fair Housing Act and the Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act and Brown v. Board, Civil Rights Act of 57 and all those things that that happened in between. So uh, I'll leave that that answer there. But um, that, that reframing uh, turns us away from bickering with one another and turns our energies towards the state and policy. Well, so with that, I'll, I'll ask the, the final question building on that. Do you think, you know, is there the hope? You've mentioned it. It's all throughout the book. You know, do you believe that there's hope to overcome racism in America? Um, I, I, I believe the hope is there. Um, I believe the potential for us to succeed is there, whether we will or not is an open question. And our history suggests that we will take another bite out of racism before our time is done, but that we will not mitigate its effects. We will not erase it. We will not get rid of it. And uh, that may be the project of our nation's life forever, how, for, ever, for however long it lives um, is, is combating racism. The question will be, will we make the right choice when the next inflection point presents itself and choose 
uh, equality or will we choose to hoard the dream and the promise for particular groups to the exclusion of others? And, and that I'm not sure of. Well, thank you so much. Uh, in the words of Langston Hughes, hold fast to dreams, right? Yes, Let's just yes. keep holding on. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's program. I want to thank you, Dr. Ted, Dr. Theodore R. Johnson, for joining us for today's Commonwealth Club program. I encourage everyone and I encourage you all to purchase his important new book, When the Stars Begin to Fall, Overcoming Racism and Renewing the Promise of America. This program will soon be posted on the club's website at www.commonwealthclub.org. I'm Cheryl Davis of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission, and this Commonwealth Club program is now adjourned.